You're good. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, so as Sarah said, my name is Michael Dixon. I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I'm glad to be a candidate for this executive director of diversity, equity, and belonging position um, here today. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, my vision for diversity, how to create buy-in. Um, but I'm going to do it in not so direct a way, but hopefully it'll make sense as I get through uh, the conversation. And I hope to be done with this at about um, either 3.40, 3.45. Give some time for questions and things. So uh, as you all might be familiar with, goal number eight um, in your strategic plan focuses on diversity, equity, and belonging. And more specifically, it talks about um, the, and it wasn't a comprehensive list, but at least a list that focused on faculty, staff, uh, diversity, um, I'm assuming how to increase that, um, looking at minority, veteran, uh, women-owned, and uh, people with disabilities, uh, vendors, and how to increase uh, the numbers of those was, um, that Ivy Tech does business with, um, and looking at uh, underrepresented um, and historically marginalized uh, students' uh, populations and how do we increase those numbers. Um, and so when I think about uh, the, my vision for diversity, um, it really is um, how do we impact the people who are currently in this room and who are not in this room who serve the students. And I think that that will have a great impact on uh, the students who will then uh, hear about Ivy Tech and then of course who will ultimately enroll here and be successful here. So let me take it back. Um, in fourth grade, um, I had to, uh, I sat in a room and I had to take the California Achievement Test. Um, which is, uh, many of you might be familiar with, it's a two and a half hour exam um, where they're, they're rating your English, you know, your writing, and your uh, math quantitative skills, whatever. Um, on that exam, you had to fill out um, a question. So I raised my hand and I had to ask my teacher a question. I said, hey, what should I put down for this question? Of course, at fourth grade, not really self-aware that she can't see my test. She was like, what question? I said, the question says, what is your race? And she said, for whatever your father is. I said, well, my father is Jamaican and my mother's Filipino. So for me, that if, whatever my father is doesn't account for what my mother is. And she had a perplexed look on her face and she said, put whatever your father is. And it was at that point that I understood the complexities of race. I knew that my parents were different uh, because of the languages that they spoke and how comfortable they were um, in the various places that we had lived prior to that moment. Uh, but it didn't really hit me until uh, that moment uh, when I had to fill out that form and to say what my race is. So I mentioned before, my dad's from Jamaica, my mother's from the Philippines. Uh, my dad, um, at 17, moved away from Jamaica um, and went to Connecticut and then ultimately joined the military. Um, he joined the Marine Corps, which gave him the opportunity to see the world in various places, went to Hawaii, Korea, uh, the Philippines, um, and then ultimately North Carolina. Uh, my mother ran away from home when she was 17, and uh, she, if you don't know anything about the military, or particularly these islands in the, like, East Asia, so uh, Japan, uh, the Philippines, uh, they tend to kind of congregate around military bases with hopes that they can get picked up by military men and then get taken away uh, to live a better life because life is really tough in some of these islands. And so that's what happened. My parents met shortly thereafter. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> shortly thereafter that, uh, my sister was born. Um, when I think about uh, companies that are doing diversity in a very strong and intentional way, um, I think about groups or companies that um, have like plans that I think would do well um, in different contexts. So uh, the group, a group of us went down. This my first time to um, a Disney property was in eighth grade. Um, but prior to that, parents didn't have a lot of money, didn't really take trips. How many of you have ever been to Disney World, Disneyland? Okay, many of you have. Um, the one thing that I can say is that so. At Disney World, um, they do diversity in a way that I think um, we can take some good information from. Um, on this, this is their name tag, and on their name tag, you can see prominently, what's the first thing you see? 
Yeah, the first thing. And it's just their first thing because uh, Walt Disney, did, he did not want to be known as Mr. Disney. He just wanted to be known as a first name basis, Walt. Um, and so that's what's prominent on this, so, uh, so that people can just, again, call the person by their first name, not sir or miss by their first name. Very informal. What's another thing that you notice on the same page? Where they're from. Where they're from. And why that's important, um, it's, an, it's a connection point. So do I have any, any uh, experience in the United Kingdom? I personally don't. So, but if I see that, that might be a, a start for that conversation and another connection point. And so, you know, we connect in a very informal way uh, and then we connect like based where people are from. And I think that's one of the ways that uh, Disney um, at least gets the conversation started um, in a very, like I said, in, in a personal way. Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, collective impact groups? Never heard that term before. Okay, we got one. All right, so collective impact groups, I think, is another way uh, that uh, in the diversity conversation that people uh, can get to work on things um, without necessarily it being a formal part of uh, that person's responsibility. So in, in the collective impact groups, you have this one main group right here. This is called the steering committee. And in the steering committee, you'll have individuals who all sit on the steering committee who are all parts of working groups, uh, who are working on various things. Um, so this could be like, for example, parking, uh, retention, uh, recruitment, uh, diversity. Uh, so it's all different aspects of that, but they all report back to this uh, larger steering committee. And people who are part of the working group can be anybody at, in the organization. So again, it's not a formal part of your role, but if you have a passion for it, you can be a part of that working group. So my vision for that diversity piece is that we're gonna get people who are involved in various aspects of the institution to be a part of that conversation, even if it's not a formal part of their responsibilities here at Ivy Tech. Um, so part of this also um, is that you have uh, mutual understanding um, you have shared activities or uh, activities that align with each other. Um, this group doesn't work, um, doesn't have an event or uh, a plan or an activity without informing these other groups. Um, that way so that everything is all shared and aligned and that people don't operate in silos because that is one of the things that kills organizations very quickly is that you're doing something over here and nobody else knows that you're doing it and then somebody else does something and they're like, well, if you would have told me that, then we could have coordinated, and it just gets really frustrating, and people tend to shut down. So that would be one of the uh, things that I would hopefully bring uh, to Ivy Tech. Um, at Manchester, where, that's my current look, my current um, place that I work at. Yes, <laughs> the current place that I work at. Um, when I first arrived at Manchester in 2011, what I felt was missing from the current set of programs and things that come from the office is a cohesive brand. Um, and so th being that this position is new, I think that one of the things that, uh, that I would do is to try to create a brand, hopefully not with Ivy in the name, <laughs> but if that's the case, then that'll be the case. Um, but what I did at Manchester was I presented this idea to our marketing department um, and the person who was working on the marketing uh, decided that they wanted to use circles to kind of represent um, the individual organizations in the office. So at that time, I was advising five student groups, and so you can probably see uh, some of the, I think she was trying to be cute with the, the colors that kind of represent the organizations. Um, and then in that, there's one unified circle because as we all understand with circles, there's no beginning, there's no end. Um, there's a sense of equality uh, with that circle um, and that it's, it's one of the strongest um, uh, things in nature with regards to a circle. Um, so that's, that's what we try to do and we based everything, all the programs um, and uh, pieces use, utilizing this brand so that people can see this without the words um, now that we are eight years in um, utilizing this as the uh, unified structure. So that would be one of the things that I'll hopefully bring here, not this particular logo, but 
something very similar to that so that you can see the work that's being done from the office and then of course uh, being able to understand like this means something. Very dark, I apologize for that. Um, how many of you have ever watched the show Designated Survivor? Okay, so many of you have, some of you have not. All right, so in Designated Survivor, in case you're not familiar with it, it showed on ABC the first two seasons and then uh, got picked up by Netflix after it was canceled. Um, in the show Designated Survivor, uh, Tom Kirkman, uh, who is played by Kiefer Sutherland, uh, he was in the safe house um, a little bit away from the Capitol building when the Capitol building blew up uh, because of uh, so a terrorist act. All the people who were in line in succession before him, starting with the president all the way down, uh, were killed in that. And he was the person that was, at that point, the head. And so he then became the president of the United States. Um, which, the, the show in and of itself is very interesting. There's a lot of uh, coalescing um, storylines. Um, but the really interesting storyline that came apart uh, from that um, was the, the storyline in the third season. This is um, his sister-in-law, Sasha. Uh, that you get introduced to. She was living in Paris at the time. Right. For those of you who have watched it, have you gotten through all three seasons? <laughs> Dang it. Sorry. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Okay, so this is Sasha. Uh, Sasha was living in Paris at the time, and uh, she uh, is a transgender woman. Um, and she initially was not being used or utilized by uh, Tom Kirkman, President Kirkman, uh, because he did not want to use her as a prop in the conversation. Um, but what you later realize is that she, um, through coaxing and uh, introduction of a support group, decided to use her platform to talk about LGBTQ issues. Um, and so I bring this part up because sometimes things happen that um, elevate certain conversations. And I think uh, what I'm understanding from the conversations I've had today is that there are certain conversations that need to be had. Um, at Ivy Tech that are going to be uncomfortable for many people involved, but it's a conversation that needs to be had because the growth is going to happen where people are up the most uncomfortable. Um, I became a qualified administrator for the Intercultural Development Inventory uh, back in December. Has anybody else heard of the IDI? Has anybody taken the IDI? Have you taken it? Okay. Um, the Intercultural Development Inventory was, uh, it started, um, it has its theoretical basis in the 1980s uh, with uh, Dr. Bennett um, and Dr. Hammer. Um, and from that, the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity then uh, gave birth to the Intercultural Development Continuum, where you have on one side or one part of the continuum, uh, the Nile mindset, which is based on a monocultural way of thinking. Um, so this is really just um, analyzing um, your intercultural development and understanding that some people are going to be in this denial phase, they don't think that culture exists, um, all the way up to adaptation and they're able to have a bicultural mindset where they can have a particular culture but they can think in cultures outside of themselves and they integrate the two very well. Um, one of the things that I would like to introduce, at least in this environment, since many of you have not taken it, is to be able to see where we are interculturally uh, so that we can then put things in place and have conversations to be able to move us, maybe, depending on where we are, where we think that we are, um, or where the uh, inter intercultural development inventory um, suggests that we are to where um, that we uh, believe that we would like to aspire to. So. Me personally, um, I believe that I am in adaptation um, based on the answers that I gave. And when I received my results, it said that I was in minimization on the cusp of acceptance. And the reason why I tell you that is because when you think about a person who does this work on a continuous basis, I've been doing this since 2004, uh, this work in diversity, equity, and inclusion since 2004, like there's still work that I have to do. So if there's still work that I'm, that I'm needing to do, then there's still work that we all need to do with regards to this. One of the last things I want to share with you is um, a TED Talk that I watched uh, fairly recently. Um, and it was on, uh, let me see if I get the title correct. Uh, Great leaders do what drug addicts do. 
one of the most interesting. When I saw it as a TED Talk, I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> Click. <laughs> um, and so uh, Michael Brody Waite, um, he was a leader in a Fortune uh, 50 company, it's either Fortune 50 or Fortune 500 company, um, ended up uh, taking a step back because of uh, the, the control that drugs had on his life. Um, and as he has continued to work on that aspect of his own life, um, he has come up with three things that he believes uh, great leaders, authentic leaders, authentic leadership um, needs to contain. So practi practicing rigorous authenticity. If you didn't catch anything else that I've said up to this point, is that I have tried to be as authentic as I can with you with regards to things that I'm thinking, things that have has happened in my life, um, and things that I might be struggling with. Um, and so you practice rec rigorous authenticity because when you show a vulnerable side, then I think people are willing to meet you at a different place than if you were always trying to present as someone who I know what I'm talking about. Like we all have uh, expertise in this room, uh, but we all have issues that we're struggling with and to be able to be at a place uh, that I can express that is something that um, I think we need to be able to do and do that comfortably. Surrendering the outcome. Things are gonna be what they are. Um, if we can approach this conversation, diversity conversation, that not everybody's gonna be there, not everybody's gonna, everybody's gonna want to have this conversation, um, I think we can try to move that forward um, because there are gonna be people who want to have this conversation and when they wanna have this conversation then we can hopefully through spheres of influence, be able to impact the individuals that need to have this conversation but are not willing to have this conversation. And then lastly is that we're going to do uncomfortable work. A lot of things that we're going to discuss are going to be things that I'm not comfortable with. Um, I might be, I might not share what I really feel because people are going to label me as either a racist or someone who is out of touch. Um, and I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to say the right things or do the right things so people don't label me as such. But in order for us to be able to move, I guess, to that next level, we have to be able to do the uncomfortable and be comfortable with the fact that sometimes we're going to make mistakes and hopefully people don't hold it against us. But if they do, it's really on that person and not on me. And with all of that, that is it. So I'm opening up to questions or anything that I've shared or things you want to know about me. Mentioned you've kind of been doing this since 2004, and you know, um, how the various positions. What has been the most meaningful work that you've done um, with as it pertains to diversity, equity, and belonging? Sure. Uh, so, you know, did everybody hear that question? Okay. Maybe I should repeat it for the camera. <laughs> uh, what is the most meaningful work that I've done um, in the past 15 years uh, with regards to diversity, equity, and belonging? Uh, I believe the most, it has to be internal, the internal work that I've, I've done. So when I was an undergraduate, um, I believed that I was going to be a statistics high school teacher uh, because somebody told me that we need more minority males teaching in the public school system. So that was my trajectory path. Um, and. In my first three years at uh, North Carolina State, I had failed a class in five of the six semesters. And I graduated with a pretty high GPA from high school, and so I always thought, like, yeah, I'm pretty smart, but my GPA doesn't reflect where I believe that I was um, at that point in time. And so after being academically suspended from the institution, I had to really reevaluate my life and what it is that I was passionate about. And so. I ended up changing my degree uh, to philosophy and race um, and really trying to understand um, why race is important in the 21st century and as a multiracial male um, and being viewed at as a black male in America, what does that mean for me and how do I interact with the environments that I'm in? And so I think that after doing that work for the next two and a half years, um, I think I had the, like, the most profound impact and a breakthrough in terms of like my own work that I need to continue doing um, in this field. Yes. 
What would you hope to accomplish um, in your work here at Ivy Tech? Uh, so, being that this is a new new role, I would hope that uh, being able to establish the, the groundwork for a successful office to be able to impact uh, the number of things that uh, the chancellor and uh, the statewide director uh, for diversity has talked about as kind of the pinnacles for this position, um, to be able to set those uh, parameters, to be able to set the groundwork for that, um, to be able to move those initiatives forward. Uh, but then also to, to work with the faculty and staff uh, on some issues uh, regarding some things that has been expressed to me in a number of different facets regarding uh, the interpersonal conflict between uh, sets of staff, um, sets of groups of staff uh, that are having um, on this campus. So, um, so doing those pieces and then um, getting the buy-in from the students. You know, in doing my research, I understand that some of the student groups are not as active as they could be. And so being able to get the buy-in from the students to understand that they have a stake in this as well, um, and that they can be um, active um, in that student development, student leadership uh, type role. What is it about community college? What's appealing to you? Uh, as you can, I don't know if you've looked at my materials, my materials were available to you. Okay. Uh, my professional experience has all been at small private liberal arts institutions. Um, and so I have basically picked other small private liberal arts institutions because that's just what I've been comfortable with. Um, I've had introduction to community college life because I taught a class in 2009 and 2010 um, at Black Hawk College um, in the Quad Cities and then again um, at Ivy Tech in 2016. Um, and so it's a different pocket um, it's a different pocket of students. Um, the work to me is similar, um, but it just takes on a different uh, takes on a different life at a community college. And I'm ready for a new challenge. I've been doing basically the same work at, at similar type institutions, and I think being able to translate what I've done successfully well at those institutions to uh, what Ivy Tech and Ivy Tech in and of itself is a unique thing because like it's a consolidated system. Whereas at other places, other states that I've lived at, it's independent institutions versus now 18, 18 campuses that all are basically trying to, in, in their own way, impact the uh, counties that they are in, but then also try to do it from a more unified standpoint. So I think that there's inherent challenge in all of that, um, but I think it's something that I'm welcome to now and I'm looking, looking forward to. How would you describe your approach in terms of uh, focusing on issues of diversity to more of an uh, apathetic audience? How would you uh, go that route? Sure. Uh, so at the institutions that I've worked at, they have been largely apathetic to uh, the work. <laughs> um, so it's not going to be something new. Um, I know that I approach my work from a very relational standpoint. Um, and I understand that this campus is pretty large. There's about 500 employees, both faculty and staff combined. So I don't know that necessarily I'm gonna get to meet everybody, um, but I think I'm gonna get to meet hopefully most, most of the folks to be able to talk about and introduce the work. And because I think that once you introduce it and people get the concepts that we're trying to convey, that the people have spheres of influence to be able to in, you know, you plant the seed, and it may not be you that germinates it, or, I mean, you can water it a little bit, and it may not grow in your presence, but it may grow somewhere else. Mm. And so to be able to do that, uh, to understand, like, this is the work that we're trying to do. Somebody else gets it. This, you're really close with that person. Why don't you two have a conversation? Because if I'm not the person that is going to be effective in getting that understanding across, perhaps this other person will be able to do that uh, with the idea that this is the, how we want to move forward that's going to greatly impact this environment. You know, I mentioned the different like work groups and how um, that's kind of going to be your approach when it comes to uh, the diversity um, ideals on campus. Is there any uh, specific um, ideals that you already have in mind that you, you want groups to work on, or like any uh, issues you already see with our campus that you want specifically to work on within those groups? I don't know about everything, but again, the one thing that I keep hearing recurringly is this issue amongst staff. Um, um, that promotions of staff uh, tend, 
individuals tend to get overlooked uh, with regards to promotions. They've been working here X amount of years. Uh, you know, opening comes up and they feel like, you know, not necessarily a sense of entitlement, but more of like I wasn't really considered for that position and somebody else got either brought in from the outside or somebody else from another department got put in. It's like, well, what about the work that I've been doing for X amount of years? Like, does that not get taken into account? And so, you know, those are some of the be those are some of the things that I would like to look at um, to be able to say, you know, is the appropriate uh, supervision available to be able to develop that person to the requisite skills to be able to move to that new level? Um, is there another place in the organization that they might be able to take their skills to be able to be more effective um, if they're looking for another opportunity? Um, so it would be so, some of that, at least what I've noticed thus far. Talent acquisition, vision, yes. We need to look far and wide. Um, a lot of times it's easy to do the local, the local search, uh, but if your talent pool is not as um, diverse um, or as expansive in the local markets, uh, we need to be able to look uh, widely and broadly um, for um, talent. Because you never know where you might discover that talent. My understanding is that people come to Ivy Tech not only from higher education, but from fields outside of higher ed. Um, and so to be able to look at those various fields and say, listen, like there are talents and things that we can learn from the business and healthcare and IT and all those different areas to be able to, to make this environment the best that it can be. Um, utilizing multiple mediums um, and different places that people would look um, and then asking folks like, when you were looking, where did you find positions at? Uh, maybe we should look at uh, the reach of this particular uh, medium versus this one because like, this is going to reach a different market that we may not have thought about reaching. You guys aren't this quiet. It's a tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. What is your personal definition of diversity? My personal definition of diversity? Mm -hmm. That has changed and morphed over time. Okay. Um, because when I originally thought about diversity, I thought about it in the aspects of like your identity um, and the, the things that you bring to the table. And now that I've been doing this work for a period of time, I realize that diversity really ex expands to ideas of thought, um, places that you are from. So a lot of the not visible pieces of diversity, the, if you think about the iceberg, I don't know if you've seen that, that photo. So the iceberg, there are things that are visible that people can kind of see when they initially interact with you. And then the under piece iceberg, there's a lot of other things with diversity. So, my personal definition really expands all of that to say, like, I even if there are people who look the same similarly uh, like in that room, they are probably not from the same place. Um, they probably have a different idea in terms of if you put a problem and how do we solve that. Uh, they probably have a different way of solving it. Um, it's just really, it's very difficult to put in a word. I just know it when I see it. Um, with regards to diversity. My question speaks to the issue of kind of the interse intersectionality aspect of diversity where you have emphasis on different subgroups, uh, the LGBT community, veterans, the disabled, and people of color. Uh, how would you describe your approach to kind of perceived disparities in the application of diversity initiatives? When we think about diversity initiatives, we can't think about it from a singular focus because we understand that people come to us from a variety of identities. You know, I, I mentioned before that my identity really is rooted in the fact that I present as a male, um, I present as a, a black person, um, I have a multiracial heritage, I'm from North Carolina, which is South, 
Not from the Midwest. Um, I've educated at larger public institutions. I've been working at smaller private institutions. Um, it's just, you bring all those pieces to the table. So when we talk about diversity and we talk about these lenses, like we can't talk about, like if we're just looking at veterans, we can't just like lump all veterans into one category, assuming that all veterans have a singular focus or a, a shared experience, which I think that they do because I mean, they're all in the military or have some military service at one point, that's what makes them veterans, but they have they bring other things to the table which are going to, it's going to inform that conversation. And so when we think about, like you said, the intersectionality piece, like we're going to take that aspect, but then we're also going to say, yes, that aspect unites this conversation, but it's so much more expansive than just looking at it from a singular focus. How do you plan on bringing the um, other points of equity and belonging into the world of dealing with diversity? Yeah. So equity, um, I think people equate, I hate using that word too, so equate equity and equality in the same conversation. So equality just means that everyone is equal. So if there are six people and there's six pieces of pizza, everybody gets one slice. Equality means that if there are six pieces of pizza and three people have already eaten, then maybe those three people don't need pizza. But the other three who have not eaten would get two slices of pizza. That would be the equity, uh, equity part. So I think having people understand the difference between equity and equality would be uh, part of that conversation. Because a lot of times people are saying, well, that's not fair. That person got this, and I didn't get that. But see, they needed that to be successful, and you didn't need that to be successful. You needed something. Um, the belonging piece is part of that inclusion conversation. So it's not one, it's not just enough to invite people to the conversation. It's not just enough to invite them for dinner. It's another thing to say, I'm inviting you to dinner and I made something that I know that you'll be able to eat. So having people understand the difference between belonging and just invite the invitation and equity and equality. Looking at your resume, I see that you're ABD at Indiana State University. Can you talk about some of your research focus and how that may or may not relate to diversity? Sure. Uh, so I mentioned before um, that at North Carolina State, I did uh, philosophy and race. I ended up creating that degree. Uh, my thesis was focused on is race important in the 21st century. Uh, my master's degree was in college student affairs leadership at Grand Valley State, and my thesis for that was racial, ethnic, and gender um, inequality in student affairs graduate preparation programs. Um, and you mentioned my uh, doctoral work, um, and my doctoral work is gonna focus on diversity, self-awareness of college and university presidents. Um, and it's really based on a, an inside higher ed and Gallup poll that was done in 2016, uh, where the presidents who were asked a number of different aspects of uh, university life. But one thing that stuck out to me was that a majority of the presidents said, about 80% of them said, oh, race relations on my campus is great. And about the same percentage, 78, 79% of them said, race relations across the US, horrible. I was like, wait a minute, so you're telling me that you believe on your campus that everything's good and everywhere else is just bad. Hmm. I, have, I have an issue with that in terms of self-awareness. So my, my focus is going to be utilizing the IDI, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so I administer that to a set of presidents and then I would have a conversation with them afterwards to see if the answers that they give about personal um, definitions of diversity and how things play out in their personal and professional life. How does that um, coalesce with what they um, say on the IDI or what the IDI would indicate uh, they are interculturally? So great week. Any Or unifying the students 
to do this work you know, of diversity? I, so again, my work has expanded. When I was at St. Ambrose, uh, we had one organization that was called Multicultural Affairs Community Action. And it was the group that united all of the minoritized groups under one group. And people thought that that was a great idea. And I thought, man, this is a horrible idea because there are things that each group needs uh, that they're not able to exact because there's only one group able with one set of resources that they're able to do the work of all these disparate groups. When I got to Manchester, there, I mentioned before, there were six organizations or five organizations at the time uh, that I directly advised um, that were all doing similar work, but they're all doing it from their respective uh, cultural or racial ethnic groups. Um, and so in my mind, I feel like people need the opportunity to be able to do the work from their respective identity or affinity groups, but then if they want to have a larger group to be able to do that work, uh, we can unify ourselves uh, to be able to do that work. But um, I would be more in favor of having identity groups uh, that people want to affiliate with. If that makes sense. Okay, I see no takers, so I'll jump in. Your resume speaks to the issue of budget and the work that you've done in diversity. Uh, what have been some of the biggest expenses with respect to the work associated with diversity? Sure. Uh, so, biggest expenses uh, with diversity work really comes in play when you're uh, trying to support some of the student initiatives. Uh, the students get an X amount of dollars with regards to um, their student organizations and they want to bring in like notable name speakers or they want to do a, a program that's going to impact the environment in this way but they only receive like $250. And so we need to be very judicious and uh, very, we want to support the student initiatives and so we do that um, by of course uh, providing financing. You all have planned it and all you need is the money, okay well the office will write a check in order to make this happen. Uh, the other thing is that we want to do um, not, not just celebratory events, but we want to do recognition events. So like our MLK uh, Remembrance and Rededication Ceremony has also uh, taken on a, uh, a large financial toll. Um, if you don't already know, Dr. King, his last collegiate place that he spoke at was at Manchester. Um, so we try to honor that by saying, you know, this, this is the last collegiate place you spoke at. Uh, we still have the podium that he spoke at um, and trying to make sure that we have individuals that come in that reinforce the messages that he was really pushing towards race, racial reconciliation, economic injustice, um, or militarism, or the, uh, to uh, fight against military. military. Um, so I think that that's where a, a lot of the costs um, have gone over the last couple of years. Do you have any questions you want to ask this group? Yes. Um, what are the most important qualities that you see for someone in this new role? Tensions that they're going to get met, even be met head on because if you keep saying 
well, this person's upset about something, that anger is smoldering over and over again. And then certain people are, you know, strategic things, they aren't being done in the hiring process. There has to be the person who's willing to put their foot down along with the administration and say, we're going to change this. I would say accountability. We don't have a lot of that here. Uh, authenticity, you already spoke to that, but more so not just holding um, us accountable, but holding leadership accountable. Um, when he talks about sweeping things under the rug, we, we sweep them under the rug, throw it in the dumpster, burn the dumpster, and <laughs> take it down the street. Um, so um, for me, um, authenticity is very important and accountability as well. And I, I would think how this role would have to work closely with HR because there are things that are happening on this campus that we have fostered a culture to allow it to continue to happen. And we don't hold folks accountable and folks are comfortable in the dysfunction. So get ready. <laughs> I hear you. I would also, she did make reference to the work with uh, HR, but I would say transparency where it's appropriate so we know that there will be some situations where whoever gets this position can't share all details of everything but at least being transparent as, as much as you can be in the position would be appreciated uh, also uh, i would have to say someone approaching this position with reasonable goals because we know that the culture is not going to be changed immediately <clears throat> And I think I represent a little bit of duality with uh, the Ivy Tech system, having spent my first nine years at the Richmond campus, right on the uh, Indiana-Ohio border. Uh, there are some campuses and there's some culture that just feels that as long as the makeup of the, as long as the makeup of the campus matches the culture of the community that we're in, then things are fine and there are no real efforts to change the internal culture because we're content with how we fit externally within the communities that we're situated in. So uh, I know that that has been one of the challenges, kind of changing the culture. And looking at this position holistically, not just Indianapolis in particular, but the Franklin, the Green Castle, the, the unique needs for those areas as well that are um, under this umbrella. So. I think something that um, as a as a non HR person but as somebody who manages staff and recruits and retains um, it's been a challenge to keep folks and particularly folks of color at the institution um, and, and that's frustrating it's hard and so I think that's something that I have particular interest in um, learning how we can do better um, and when we learn, and when we learn things that maybe we wish we didn't, you know, we have to hear them and go and do something. Um, and so I think that's a piece of it. I think that the person who can come in and do this work and connect it back to, if we are getting this right, we are serving the goal of the institution and the goal of our of our students being successful um, and our communities being successful in each other. I think that's going to be. Um, and an important point to keep drawing it back to because I think one thing that you would I hope that you would find I hope anybody would find when they come into our community um, is that everybody here will tell you that they're here you know, like for the right reasons like you know to quote my summertime guilty pleasure television show The Bachelor um, like but we're all here for the students we got you know, you gotta love you guys but like we're all here for these students like we all say that and I do think that the majority of people really tr truly do mean that they're for. That they want to that they want to help people um, access education and make a better life for for themselves and for their families. And I think they don't see how all of, um, uh, that all impacts it. Um, and so I think you'd find folks that are like, well, if I just teach my class and I pass my students, that's all I have to do. Or if I just process this paperwork quickly and efficiently and I return my my phone calls and my voicemails in that designated time that I'm doing it, or if I, you know what I mean? And I don't think there's a, always that bigger connection. Um, so um, I think that's, you know, it's, it's a, 
it's simple and it's very complex at the same time. Good luck. <laughs> What is your, I think you kind of alluded to this, but what is your favorite part about working at Ivy Tech? Not knowing what to expect. I mean, <laughs> quite honestly, I mean, you may start your day off as far as having, having an idea of what you were going to do, but a situation may present itself with a student, and then you may have to pitch in and handle the student issue. I don't know where I'm going, or I just had an argument with my instructor, those types of things, and we're just trying to, uh, again, knowing what we're expected to do, but being adaptable um, as needed to uh, come up with creative solutions to uh, solve problems. I think, um, yeah, and I, I didn't work in small frame, but I worked at a you know, mid-size public. And I loved it, it was really fun. But I look back on it, like those students would have been fine without me. Like anybody could have been in that role and they would have been fine. They're gonna go be teachers and nurses and, and whatnot. Um, but I think here, like, you really, really can make a difference. Um, and it's hard, like we don't have like fancy endowments and you know, sometimes we can't always buy paper clips by the end of the year, or whatever, you know, whatever it is, but. Well, you should plan that better. You? I was going to you're going to back up on finance. I know. I'm, I'm saying I'm, it's not fine. It's just resources. It's yeah. cause, not because you didn't or it's not because of that. But I mean, you run out of, you know, you have a. You can't, you know, we don't always have appropriate staffing. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. We are a lean, lean organization. Um, but, man, those, those ones are big. Um, and it's really cool. Kind of when it happens, and it's just really, really devastating when it doesn't work. Um, so the stakes are high, but it's uh, it's worth it, despite all the stuff. It's a good place. Anybody else? What's your favorite part about working at Ivy Tech? For me, it's obvious the students. You know, see that, see that growth. And, you know, I remember having the first time I was in my in my assistantship work, and you know, having those students that are growing and they're fighting and fussing over grades. Next thing you know, a couple years later they graduate. And next thing you, know, you hear them, they're graduating from you know IEP. We had some students getting their masters. So seeing that, you know, they're fighting and fussing, right? You have to go to class. So okay, they're graduating. So now you know you're having a family, and you're going to get another level of education. That's that's gratifying. The, the quietness, this is a fun group of people to work with. <laughs> I think everybody's talking. Yeah, I get that. Sarah, I think I'm good. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.